Hey, what's up dudes, John Bray here. Today I wanted to do a video on deck building. I've been getting a lot of requests lately on how I approach it. Something I tend to do off stream as well. So I wanted to let you guys in on the sort of process I do in refining and building a deck. So the first thing you need when it comes to building a deck is an idea. This could be some specific combo of cards that you think is potentially powerful and you want to build the rest of the deck around that. Or it could simply be an archetype that you want to be refining. For this video will be going with an idea and the idea in this case is that Bog Spine Knuckles plus Dread Corsair is a very powerful tempo combo. So we have our basic combo but where do we go from there? Well we can start off by thinking about what cards have good synergies with either of these cards. So for Dread Corsair we want to be using high attack weapons ideally with four or more attack. Unfortunately, Shaman doesn't have access to any of them outside of Bogspine Knuckles. Stormforge Axe, Fist of Raden, and Doomhammer all have two low of attack. Splitting Axe, you're really overpaying by a mana cost to get a 3-2 weapon. You really have to be making use of the Battle Cry, summoning copies of totems if you want to go down this route. And that's going to really define the rest of our deck. I don't think the synergy with that Dread Cost today is strong enough to justify us going down that route. And if we're buffing our totems, totems have bad synergy with evolve effects, I would say, since all the buffs that we put on our totems get completely nullified if we were to evolve them with bog, bog spine knuckles or any other evolve effects if we were running them. So because of this, I don't think any of the weapons are worthy of inclusion in this deck. Now, as for the evolve effects, we've had a lot of evolve effects in the past, so the knowledge on what works well with it is already known. So we're going to go ahead and put in Desert Hair and Mogu Flesh Shaper initially. These are two cards which have great synergy with Evolve Effects. And to make those better, we're going to put in Mutates and Clackers, both extra synergy cards to give a bit of redundancy on Evolve Effects. So when we don't draw the Knuckles, we can still sometimes make use of these cards. From here, we're going to be still trying to find out what cards work well with Evolve Effects. But first let's talk about Mogu Flesh Shaper. Mogu Flesh Shaper has worked best with decks that can flood the board super quickly. In the past we saw Thunderhead plus Overload effects to vomit a load of minions on the board on the same turn very cheaply. Unfortunately Shaman doesn't have access to this anymore. We could try to build the deck in a way where we're trying to flood the board a lot in hopes of making Mogu Flesh Shaper cheaper, maybe even put Sea Giant in there as well. But Shaman simply just doesn't have access to good ways of doing this anymore with the rotation of Thunderhead and Voltaic Burst. Instead we can try and build a deck which has natural evolve synergy. So with the nerf to Mogu Flesh Shaper and Shaman's general lack of an ability to spread wide as quickly anymore, we're not going to be really trying to go all in on Mogu Flesh Shaper and has it, have it as the defining part of the deck. It will be good when you can get it off with the evolve effects, but we're not going to be getting it down for zero mana every single game. So to get the most out of Evolve Effects, we want to be doing it on cards which have high value but low stats for their mana cost. And in general, these are going to be Battle Cry cards. So if we're looking for good Battle Cries with low stats, Galakrond is a natural fit. Devoted Maniac, 4 mana 2-2. Two, two. Double Invoke Guy, 6 mana 3-3. Three, three. Great minions to evolve, which are also doing high value Battle Cries and giving us a high value game plan as we're working towards a, a Galakrond himself. So with all that, we basically have our archetype with essential cards in it now, and we're basically looking to pad out the rest of it with just good cards that help to boost what we're trying to do with the deck and counter the meta game which we're going to be in. So for build one, I put in some generic cards that I thought were just good. Sludge Slurper, Great One Drop, Storm's Wrath, has synergy with wide boards, which we're going to get from Desert Hair and our big evolve effects. And I also wanted to try out Horde Pillager. It's a 4 mana 4 2, which is a bad stat line for its cost. Gets back our bog spine knuckles, and then we can immediately evolve it. So it seems potentially very strong in the deck. Now, I never thought that running two of them was a good idea because it was going to be a dead card a lot of the time. But for the purposes of just testing how good the card is, I put two of them in the deck just so we have a higher frequency of drawing the card, so we could get a sense of how it feels in the deck. Ultimately, I found that it was not a good inclusion, even as a one-of. Basically, 
for the card to have any effect, you already have to have been equipping Bog Spine Knuckles, have swung with it twice to destroy it, and then need to make use of another two swings of it for it to be good. And in general, I found that the games where you've got two swings off of Bog Spine Knuckles and are still in the game, you're usually going to be very far ahead at that point. So we didn't need the extra value of Horde Pillager. If I've already swung on my second swing, the Horde Pillager itself isn't getting evolved. So in terms of evolving Horde Pillager's body, it's not until you've had three swings, essentially, of Bog Spine Knuckles for it to be good, and it still costs four mana. And that's in the situations where you have the nut curve of already drawing the Knuckles. Most of the time, Horde Pillager is just a four mana 4-2, which is un completely unplayable for when you don't have the Knuckles. As for Storm's Wrath, the card itself benefits from having a wide board, but it was quite hard to achieve this as the Shaman. Using it to just buff any sort of board, which is later on going to get evolved by our evolve effects, was a waste of a card, I think. As for Sludge Slurper, it's just a decent one drop, which stays in the deck for a long time, but spoiler alert, doesn't stay in there forever. And I'll get onto that why in the future, but for a lot of these builds, Sludge Slurper will be included. So for build 2 we took out Horde Pillager and Storm's Wrath and put in generic good cards, Serpent Shrine Portal and another one drop in Surging Tempest which has some synergies with Sludge Slurper and the portal itself. Now Serpent Shrine Portal is on paper a good card but I don't think it was very suited to this deck even though I had it in there for a long time. The problem with the portal isn't in its raw strength. If we take a look at our list, the curve of the deck is actually quite high. We have a high density of cards around the 5 and 6 mana cost. The problem with Serpent Shrine Portal is the overload. If you play it on turn 3, going first you overload your turn 4. So you can't curve into a Devoted Maniac for instance. And because the curve of the deck is quite high, we can't fill out that next turn with 3 cost cards or one cost plus whatever cards and still expect it to be a good turn. When you're going second, a lot of the time you want to be going coin into five. To either go coin box by knuckles or coin shield of Galakrond, for instance. The curve of the deck isn't low enough to justify going coin three, for instance, that often. A lot of the time you're going to want to be saving the coin. So you can't really do something like coin serpent shrine portal into totem. It's kind of just too weak of a play. And if you're saving the coin and you just play Serpent Shrine Portal on turn 3, you're overloaded so you can't go coin 5 on the next turn. So ultimately, Serpent Shrine Portal is a very, very good card. It's just not suited for this deck because it just disrupts the mana curve too much. There's not really a good turn to be playing it. Surging Tempest is a good 1-drop, but again, probably not well suited for this deck. The only overloads are the Portal and the Slurper. We already discussed why the portal wasn't so good. Right now, we're currently in a very Demon Hunter heavy meta game. Battle Fiend is a very threatening one drop from Demon Hunter, and not having the required attack on our one drop to be able to one for one trade into it is usually going to leave us at a disadvantage. Now, as we approach build three, I was able to get some data from HS Replay from some of the early builds, and I found that Dragon's Pack had a very low win percentage of both Mulligan and Drawn win rate. And it kind of makes sense. Since the change to Corrupt Elementalist, you can no longer go coin double invoke into Dragon's Pack. And of course, Dragon's Pack itself was nerfed. So the only way to get an early Dragon's Pack is if you've drawn either two Invocation of Frosts or a Frost plus a Devoted Maniac. And then turn five, it's going to be active, which doesn't really happen a large percentage of the time. What's more is that Bogspine Knuckles itself has kind of bad synergy with Dragon's Pack. The tokens that you get from Dragon's Pack only cost 2 mana, even though they're 4 or 5s. As for the other inclusions, at this point in time I haven't properly realised how disruptive Serpent Shrine Portal is to the mana curve. I'm going to figure that out a bit later. Now we put in Hench Clan Hogsteed into the deck as an answer for Battle Fiend and other 2 health creatures. Invocation of Frost is great against it, but you can only run 2 of them. So Hench Clan and Hogsteed is in there as a, another version of that, basically. Now, it does stay in the build for a while. It is kind of okay against the Demon Hunt cards, but remember you're spending two mana to deal with a 
one mana minion from them, so you're losing tempo that way, and the 1-1 one, one you get left over from HenchClan Hogseed is basically nothing against the Demon Hunter because they have a 1 mana hero power, uh, Twin Slice available to deal with it. I also found that the deck sometimes lacked a bit of value. Um, we had long games against Warlocks, for instance, where we just ran out of stuff and couldn't put enough pressure on them. In terms of value, there are three cards that I've tried. Evil Totem being the one in this build. Also tried Farsight and Mana Tide Totem. For Evil Totem, it is a good card, but I think it really suffers um, against Demon Hunters because they can so efficiently clear it that you don't want it ever in your mulligan against them. And since Demon Hunter is such a large percentage of the metagame, I ultimately found that it wasn't a good card to have. Similar deal for Mana Tide Totem, it just never sticks. Farsight I found was pretty good. There's a lot of cards you want to be comboing together in this deck. Any sort of invoke plus an involve is usually going to be a very good play, but it's quite expensive. Farsight essentially allows you to do that all on one turn, where you wouldn't have the mana to do so otherwise. Before the next build, I just want to touch it on the Lurker below. There was a day when Spell Druid was insanely popular, and I put Lurker below in the deck. It kind of makes a bit of sense. Lurker below is a great answer to Glowfly Swarm, and a 6 mana 6 free body with a powerful battle cry is an excellent target to be evolved. But ultimately, I found that the card just wasn't pulling enough weight in the majority of matchups, and it just came online maybe a turn too late. And when it wasn't good, 6 mana 6 free deal 3 to a minion isn't that great of a play. As for build 4, we have Imprisoned Vilefiend coming in over Hench Clan Hogsteed. Now, I was inspired a little bit from No Hands Gamer's Egg Warrior build, which is an excellent deck that has surfaced very recently. And I noticed how it was really a very good play to Imprison Vilefiend on either turn 1 or 2, and then copy it after value trading with Bloodsworn Mercenary. Now, there's no Bloodsworn Mercenary in this deck, but we do have a Bogstrop Clacker, which kind of has similar effects of when it's powerful. Now, most of the time, Bogstrop Clacker just didn't have a target on turns 3 or 4 for you to evolve. But the Imprisoned Valfine is basically stats that are on the board which your opponent can't deal with until it pops up. So you, what you can do is play the Imprisoned Valfine, get a value trade, and then evolve it with Bogstrop Clacker. It's not going to be a huge stat increase, but it's pretty much guaranteed value. Imprisoned Valfine actually has pretty good synergy with Mogu Flesh Shaper. What tends to happen is, while he's dormant, your opponent is forced to develop their side of the board and can't trade anything off, and that's naturally going to make Mogu Flesh Shaper cheaper. And then the turn he pops up, you get an extra 1 mana discount on it, and then you can start rushing into their side of the board, so you're not losing tempo overall, but you have that one turn where there's a large amount of minions on both sides of the board. As for the rest of this build, I wanted to try to make use of Farsight a little bit better and try and get a bit more value. So we introduced Archmage Vargoth. He has great synergy with Invocation of Frost, giving you uh, multiple invokes if you want to get towards a Galakron quicker. And sometimes you can go Vargoth Farsight to get a lot of card draw. Because I put in Vargoth, I put in back one Dragon's Pack because Vargoth Dragon's Pack is such a powerful turn. After playing with it for a while, I just found that it's too late in the game to combo Vargoth most of the times. Uh, usually you're going to be playing Vargoth on turn 4, and then if you've done that, the Dragon's Pack's not going to be online at that stage of the game because you haven't invoked enough, and you don't really want to be playing Farsight on turn 5 because you have access to much better plays like Bog Spine Knuckles or Shield of Galakrond. So even though it sounded pretty good in practice, it just wasn't getting mu that much value. So as I talked about before with the Imprisoned Vilefiend having great synergy with Mogu Flesh Shaper, it kind of inspired me a little bit to run Stealth Minions. We're basically running on a similar principle in that you can develop tempo on your side of the board that the opponent can't interact with, so they're forced to develop themselves, and then we're going to end up in a state with a lot of minions on the board before we start doing trades. Now in this final build, we have actually excluded Sludge Slurper. Now Sludge Slurper is an excellent card, however, there's a couple things which make it not so good right now. The first being Demon Hunters. Before it was perfectly fine to play Sludge Slurper on 1 against a lot of decks. 
even if they had a hero power that they could use on it, it's going to cost them two mana. So the net losing tempo against Demon Hunter is not the case. Even if you're going first and you play it, Demon Hunter can just respond with their hero power and you don't really gain anything in that regard. If you're going second, it's even worse because they could have already developed a one drop at that point and then hero power your guy and they're just snowballing their advantage. What's more is that Sludge Slurper is really bad to play around turn four because again, like we talked about with the portal, the overload is just too damaging. So what I found was the case was that I just had Sludge Surfer in my hand and the mana to play it, but I just couldn't play it because I couldn't afford the overload for the next turn. Wargon Infiltrator has a lot of things going for it. It's a stealth minion. Stealth means you're going to have more minions on both sides of the board uh, to make your Mogu Flesh Labor cheaper. Stealth's great with evolve effects. You can keep it stealthed until you want to evolve it with a Bogstrop Clacker or keep it stealthed in order to get a big swing turn with the Bogspine Knuckles. And it's a one mana answer to Battle Fiend, which the Demon Hunter can't remove. So if you play this going first, you can keep it stealth to answer Battle Fiend. Or if you're going second, you can use it in response to trade off their Battle Fiend. And the Demon Hunter is not going to be able to snowball their board advantage. The last inclusion of the deck, and one I'm actually most satisfied with, is Escaped Mana Saber. This card has the stealth synergy that we talk about with Mogu Flesh Shaper, which is great. You can pretty much guaranteed a value trade with this thing and then evolve it with Bog Spine Knuckles uh, if you're going down that route, which is also great. One of the best interactions with it is just the extra mana crystal you get. One of the current weaknesses I found with this deck was going second, turn threes were really quite bad. You didn't have a high enough density of good four mana plays to go coin four into four on turn three that often, and the on-curve plays for turn three were usually quite bad. We're looking at Box Struck Clacker or Desert Hair on their own or just a far sight, which aren't really going to be huge tempo plays. With Escape Mana Saber, you can go Coin Mana Saber, which is excellent tempo. And then when we do the attack of the Mana Saber, you're going straight into five to open up things like Bog Spine Knuckles or Shield of Galakrond. If you're going first and you play Mana Saber on four, that allows you to skip straight into Corrupt Elementalist. Uh, and if you have something like Mutate in the hand, that's like an extremely good tempo play. So overall, Escape Mana Saber does an excellent job of bridging bad turns normally into the deck and allowing you to get towards those more powerful 5 and 6 mana turns, whilst also having synergy with Evolve effects by having Stealth and with Mogu Flesh Shaper. So yeah, this is the current build we're on with this deck, and I'm extremely happy with it. Every card serves a purpose and does well in the meta game. There are a few other tech cards that have been nice. One of the things I noticed was playing against OTK Demon Hunters, freezing their face is really good with Invocation of Frost. So you might want to include tech choices like Frozen Shadow Weaver for extra freeze effects so you, so you get off more likely. So hope you guys enjoyed the video, getting a little insight in how I approach deck building. Hopefully it helps you out a little bit if you're going to be building decks of your own. Catch you on the next one.